Good afternoon. Welcome to the Concord Book Shop. Uh, nice place to spend on Super Bowl Sunday afternoon. Mm -hmm. You can get away from the 12 hours of pregame show here. Uh, birth of a baby is supposed to be a wonderful event. But when you combine it with an old Victorian house, a yard sale of old stuff from an attic, and the sudden appearance of an old high school friend, uh, you have the makings of a first-class mystery. Today's author, Hallie Efron, knows how to combine all of these elements. She's the mystery reviewer of the Boston Globe and the writer of A Thousand and One Books for Every Mood and Writing and Selling Your Mystery, which was nominated for both an Edgar and an Anthony Award. And so, without further ado, I'd like to welcome Hallie Efron. Thank you all for coming out as a pre a pre uh, Super Bowl treat. <laughs> Escape from my own house where my kids are getting ready for uh, getting very drunk. I think <laughs> <laughs> my grown daughters. Um, thank you for a great introduction, and um, um, that's what I am. I'm a writer. I uh, I I write fiction. I come from a family of writers. People always want to know, am I Nora's sister? Yes, I'm Nora's sister. And I am Delia's sister, and I'm Amy's sister, and I'm Henry and Phoebe's daughter. and So that we're all writers. The whole family is a family of writers. And I'm the one who insisted for many years that I didn't write. And then when I was about, uh, oh, I don't even want to tell you how old. I got a call from a magazine writer who asked if she could write a piece about me because I was the only one who didn't write. And I said, you know, if anyone's going to write about me not writing, it's going to be me. <laughs> and I started taking classes. I went to, you know the little yellow building in Harvard, in, in, in Cambridge, the uh, Cambridge Adult Ed Center. I went there and I took a class in essay writing with uh, Mopsy Strange Kennedy. Does everybody know Mopsy? Mm -hmm. She writes for the, uh, for, right now she writes for the Improper mm -hmm. Bostonian. And I figured I could write essays because I didn't need to do any research and I have plenty of opinions. And that was true. The first one I wrote, I got published. It was called The History of My Hair. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I sold it to National Public Radio. And I thought, oh, this is easy. <laughs> Not. Uh, what that original sale did is it fueled me for about seven years of rejection. And that was the best thing that could have happened to me, because I might have given up a lot earlier. Um, from there, I wrote a nonfiction book uh, about a true crime, which I put away. And I collaborated, began to collaborate with a co-author uh, to write this series, uh, the Dr. Peter Zack Mysteries. And we wrote five of those. They were published by St. Martin's. And then we decided to go our separate ways. And then, I, as uh, Bert said, I went on and wrote a book about mystery writing, uh, as if I knew what I was doing, I wrote. And um, then I wrote this book called A Thousand and One Books for Every Mood, which is a lot of fun. And in the meanwhile, I started this. Um, which I kind of feel like is my first novel, more than uh, one of the Peter Zak books, because I, I really wrote it myself. It was my ideas. It's about things that I'm interested in. Um, when I wrote with my co-author, we wrote about neuropsychology, about the criminal justice system. This is about how do you, what happens when the person that you trust lies to you. This is about what it's like to be pregnant with your first child after you've had three miscarriages. This is about what it's like to have, to be at that point in your life where you have everything to, you, you seem to have everything, something goes wrong, and all of a sudden you have everything to lose. Um, uh, Bert asked me if it was uh, set in Milton, which is where I live. Does anyone know Milton? Well, it is set in Milton, but we call it Brush Hills. <laughs> uh, everyone knows Brush Hill Road, which is the street that goes right down the middle of that. So I called it Brush Hills, and it's, um, if you know East Milton, if you know Milton, then you know this area, because there are so many things in it that are just, I mean, there's a basement bowling alley, for instance, in East Milton Square, and a very important scene in the book takes place in that bowling alley. and. Uh, and um, th I got the idea for the book about a stone's throw from that bowling alley. I was at a yard sale. And the book opens with a yard sale. 
Uh, actually, my husband is addicted. My husband, I'm sitting here, my sweet husband, is completely addicted to them. It's Saturday nights in my house. It's like Sherman planning his his march. Uh, you know, he's got the Patriot Ledger printout and the and the uh, the, the different papers plotting it on the map. How his plan of attack. Well, this was a yard sale around the corner from us, so I could just walk over there. And it was at a house my daughter used to play at, at a Victorian house. Looks beautiful from the outside, and they had turned it from yellow to pink, to mauve, actually. They'd taken out all the yew bushes and put in hydrangeas, so you know what kind of uh, change this was. And I was sure they had taken out walls. You, you just seen, it's, so much had been done. I was dying to know how was it different from when I had been in this house. Plus, it's a it's not a good Victorian. You know, there are Victorians that are very light and airy, and then there are Victorians that are small and rabbit warreny. It's as if they were designed to conserve heat at all costs. So this actually had a living room that had no windows. I mean, you came in the front hall, and then you went into a doorway, and there was the living room, this tiny little room with a fireplace. No light. So I knew they had to be taking out walls doing major work. So I'm peppering the woman in the driveway with questions. And I finally think she got sick of me, and she said, would you like to go inside and look around? And I said, I'd love to go inside and look around. She pointed to the door and said, go on, help yourself. It's empty inside. Now, I think she's a, a lunatic. I mean, who would let a complete stranger into your house? But I guess I, I look kind of harmless. And so I let myself in. And I'm wandering around the first floor, and it is drop-down dead gorgeous. They've taken out walls. They've got window treatments. It's beautiful. And I go up to the second floor, and Laura Ashley, this. And finally, I'm getting up to the third floor. And the mystery writer in me finally kicks in. And I thought, what if? A woman goes to a yard sale, she talks her way into the house, she goes inside, and she never comes out. Oh. And that was what I said when I thought of it, and as a result I was out of that house in about five seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Skid marks on the driveway as I uh, headed home, and I knew I had the idea for a book. And thank goodness I had an idea, because the way my co-author and I had collaborated we collaborated on plot, and we would bounce ideas back and forth. And I was terrified. I'd been terrified for a year that I wasn't going to come up with an idea. And here I knew I had it, an idea, an idea that excited me. I didn't know how it started. I didn't know how it ended. But by the time I got home, I knew that my protagonist, the woman having the yard sale, would be nine months pregnant, and that she would have suffered several miscarriages before now. And that the woman coming to the yard sale would be someone that she knows, someone she went to high school with but doesn't know well. And this woman would be nine months pregnant, too. So, and I, you know, I had written the book about mystery writing. I knew how important it was to raise the stakes. And for a woman, for me, there was no point in my life when the stakes were higher than when I was ready to have my first child. I mean, I didn't know if I would get through childbirth in one piece, if the baby would be healthy, if my husband would be happy with the change in our, in our marriage. And I was marooned in my house. I mean, I worked in Cambridge for 10 years. I didn't have a single friend, or maybe one or two friends, in Milton. And I just felt so alone. So I wanted to write about that really vulnerable time in your life where you feel like a Mack truck and your ankles are, are, are swollen and, and, and you're you know sitting at the dinner table eating peanut butter and baked beans while everyone else <laughs> is eating shrimp. You know? <laughs> and uh, that, I wanted to write about that time. And so I started writing the book. And I didn't follow any of the advice that I give people in my own writing book. Uh, I just started writing. And this is a very big mistake particularly if you're writing this kind of book, which is, this isn't a mystery so much as a psychological suspense novel. It's more of a, it's not so much a whodunit as it is a what's going on here kind of book. And uh, it just gets very slowly revealed to the reader exactly what is going on. And um, so when I started writing, I just started writing. And as a result, the process was very ugly. I didn't have a contract for the book. 
I hadn't told my agent what I was working on. I just wrote. And as a result, I kept getting stuck. People say, do you get writer's block? I really don't get writer's block. I get idea block. I don't know what is going to happen next, or if I did know what was going to happen next, when I go to write it, it seems preposterous, because the characters have changed since I started this novel, and I'm pushing them to do something that no longer feels right. And the one thing that I have learned is do not herd characters. If characters don't want to go there, there's a reason for it. They need to go somewhere else. They, and you know, writers talk about, oh, my characters took over. <laughs> If only my characters would take over, I would be so grateful. They don't take over, they just balk. You know, and it's like put, trying to push that mule up to the, up to the water trough. And uh, there's one point in the book where uh, I had my character stuck in an attic. I hope I'm not giving too much away, but she's <laughs> stuck in an attic. <clears throat> and I couldn't figure out how to get her out. I had to, so I, earlier I thought I knew how, but it seemed ridiculous. I mean, she's nine months pregnant. She couldn't possibly do what I had in mind for her to do. So I was stuck with her, and I think we were there for about six weeks, she and I, <laughs> stuck in that attic. And I couldn't move forward. So I kept doing everything that they tell you to do in the writing classes, which is outline your book and try different things, or mind map the book, or put all your plot points on pink and green and yellow index cards and shuffle them around. And s I was trying everything. I mean, you know, I was ready for the Ouija board by the, uh, by the end of this. and. Um, I went back 50 pages, I went back 100 pages, tried to revise and write my way back up to that point. Finally, I was on the way to Connecticut driving uh, to see my friend Roberta Islip, whose books are here. Uh, she writes uh, wonderful mysteries. And um, I was thinking for some reason about children's games. I was thinking about Monopoly. Remember the little metal pieces that the old games used to have? I used to love those. And I was thinking about Candyland, which is an ugly cardboard game now, and it used to have beautiful plastic pieces. And then I started thinking about chutes and ladders. And a light bulb went off in my head. And I won't tell you if it's a chute or a ladder, but it was one of those that got Ivy out of the attic. And it just seems that this is what happens to you as a writer, is you get stuck, and you work and you work, and you do all the, quote, work that you're supposed to do to get out, and it doesn't work. And then you stop thinking about it, and you think about something else and you get the breakthrough. And it's almost invariably at a time when you cannot write. So it's either when you're frying chicken, or <laughs> taking a shower, or swimming, or for, in my case, driving a car. But I was very grateful for that, uh, for that breakthrough. But really, I, it just sent me on the way to the next plot hole, because this book was just riven with moments of, I just don't know how I'm going to get my character to go to the next place. I think part of it was I didn't have a contract, I didn't have a deadline. Contracts and deadlines are wonderful things for writers. They make you do what you never thought you could do, you know. Uh, you just put the pedal to the metal and you, and you write. So some of the things that I, you know, looking back now, it's interesting that, you know, you don't really, I don't think about themes and so on when I go in to write, but I know that one of the themes in this book is secrets. That secrets can be toxic. And there's a line in the book, secrets can be toxic. The truth is never as horrible as what one imagines. And that's definitely one of the themes in this book. Um, I wanted to write about the vulnerability of pregnancy, which I've talked a little bit about. I wanted to write about teenagers. Um, when I was in high school, and I think it's still true, high school was like... Uh, you know, a layered souffle or a tiramisu, you know, it was the kids at the top, the popular kids who seemed to have everything, who just seemed to glide through high school without a worry, which of course I know isn't how it is from, from their point of view, but to the rest of us, they just look like they're, you know, having a ball. And in my book, David, Ivy's husband, was the quarterback, the high school quarterback who you know, went to BC and uh, uh, played football, came from a wealthy family. He was a kid who was in that top layer. And yet, he's actually just an average Joe. I mean, he never even was aware of being particularly popular. He's just kind of a person. Ivy, who's more like me, came from the middle strata. She was the one who watched the popular kids. Who, you know, if she was in the drama club, she would have been painting 
the scenery. Uh, if she wasn't the best athlete, but she was an athlete. She wasn't the smartest kid, but, you know, she was smart. So that was really kind of my character. And Melinda, who's the woman who comes to the yard sale and disappears, was from the bottom strata. Fortunately, of the much smaller strata, fortunately. She was the girl who sat alone, who was overweight, who had skin problems, who was always singing slightly off key with everyone else, you know? She wanted to make friends and when she would make overtures and someone would open the door to her, she 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 just didn't she just didn't connect. You know, if my if my co author was writing this book he would have said, you know, she was a kid with Asperger's. She probably was, you know. Just not reading faces, not getting humor, just a little bit off key. And as a result she was teased and tormented and a lot of kids are teased and tormented and feel like outsiders in high school and a lot of them end up to be perfectly fine adults. They go to college, they meet kids that they connect with and they're okay. And Melinda's not one of those kids. She's a kid who even though she lost weight, even though she's gotten herself together, she carries the wounds with her and uh, she, she really hasn't improved. I definitely wanted to write about yard sales. I love them. And uh, I think it's, of course, uh, in this economy, you know, how we're all going to be furnishing our houses. Uh, but um, as I said, my husband is a big yard sale lunatic. and He's on strict instructions, no more bedroom sets. <laughs> uh, but he does bring wonderful things back. I, I buy things. These are my wonderful earrings from the yard sale. Anything else? No, that's it. And, uh, and um, there, there was a wicker basket that Jerry brought home one day that I put in this book and that I've wanted to write about. I put it in about six short stories, and I finally found a home for it. It's in this book. And that wicker basket, I will give you the inside scoop on it. My husband can, uh, used to garbage pick, and uh, his, uh, his definition of the worst invention of the 20th century would probably be the black plastic garbage bag, because he can't tell what you throw it away. <laughs> He used to go uh, in different directions on different nights where, to see what people were throwing away and brought back some of my favorite things. I have some silver, uh, silver plated ladles and, and I can't remember what all the things he brought home, but they've been wonderful. Um, but this was a daytime. He went out walking in a direction and he'd not been gone more than 10 minutes when he came rushing back, jumped in the car and announced someone was throwing something away that he had to have, but it was too big too heavy, so he needed our Chevy, what was it, a 1978 Caprice, wagon. Caprice station wagon, yeah. You know, one of those ones that sachets. <laughs> yeah. So off he went, and I'm thinking, oh no. Back he comes, he opens the trunk, and there is a wicker basket, a trunk, with a sl uh, slanted back and metal hardware and a label a cer in, with Cyrillic writing on it and uh, wooden slats on the bottom. Clearly, it was once a shipping trunk, you know, designed to go in a ship's hold. So we wrestle it out of the station wagon. I'm getting excited. What, what could be in this thing? Because it weighs a bloody ton. We open it up. It's got ledgers in it, these big leather ledgers, like each one about this big. And it's just got a lot of writing in them. Not exciting. So we threw away the ledgers and I hosed down the inside and tried to get rid of the stink, it stank, um, thinking maybe we could use it inside. And off he goes to complete his walk. Five minutes later, he's back. There's another trunk. Oh. <laughs> it's a little bigger than the last one. He's got to go get it. So he goes, and I'm thinking, I'm stuck in, do you remember the 4,000 hats of Bartholomew Covens, where the, Bartholomew Covens keeps taking off his hat to bow to the king, and every time he takes it off, there's another bigger hat inside. Well, I could just see my house awash in trunks, and, and, but so this new trunk came back. It was also filled with ledgers. We rinsed it out, too, and that was the end of the story, but uh, in my brain, I could what if, what if, what if, what if we had opened the trunk and there had been something wonderful in it? something that testified to the tragedy in someone's past. Or, and you can go on and on if you're a writer, with all the wonderful things that might have been in this trunk. And 
when I went to write that part of this book and Ivy opens the wicker trunk, there are wonderful things in it. And when she closes it, and she and David leave it at the curb because they can't keep it, it's just too stinky, somebody puts something in it. So the wicker basket becomes very pivotal in the book. The other thing I wanted to write about, besides the wicker basket, is the house that got away. Um, when I was, I actually think I might have been pregnant with my first child when we looked at that house. It's possible, or I was about to be. At any rate, we looked at a house on, on if you know Milton, uh, Lower uh, Randolph Avenue, uh, near, near Lower Mills. That was a good Victorian. It had been built by someone with serious money. The rooms were enormous. There was light, there was stained glass, there was a leather wallpaper in the hall, there was a, a circular staircase with a carved uh, banister and a newel post at the bottom with a bronze figure of a woman holding up a light. Again, that, these are all, you'll see, these are all in the book. I used all of this. Um, the interior, there were seven fireplaces on the first floor, all with their own hand-painted fireplace tiles around. Beautiful floors. The outside of the house looked as if it had been sandblasted because it hadn't been painted in so long. The balustrade outside on the front porch was falling down. If you went up to the attic, you could see the sky through the roof. Because the person who lived in the house was a, a lone man and he had retreated to the kitchen. He lived in the kitchen. He had a single light bulb. He turned off all the electricity of the rest of the house, all the plumbing. You couldn't even flush a toilet to see if there was water pressure in this house. And he had turned off the heat. He had a wood-burning stove, a cot, and a light bulb. And he'd been living there, I think, for a decade. And I think the, the electrical bill was something like $24 for the year or something ridiculous. You know? So we we're idiots. We bid on this house. We have home repair skills that were only slightly more pathetic than our income. And I don't know what we thought we were doing. Fortunately, we were overbid. And fortunately, the people that bought the house, uh, the husband is an architect. So when they moved in and they discovered that those seven fireplaces had seven chimneys, each with three flues in them, and they all needed to be rebuilt before you even paint the outside. We were very glad we hadn't bought it. Um, they also found a hidden room. Uh, it was a, a room that you walk into, one of, the, one of the entry rooms. Above it, there was a hatch in the ceiling, which I hadn't noticed. And when they went up there, put a ladder up, it, there was a room. Not a crawl space, a room. It was the only way to get to the room was through this hatch, and heaven only knows, so you'll see in the book. All of this. This house uh, was inspiration, and it was easily two decades before I started writing this book. That I, uh, but I, you know, this, as I say, this was like my first novel in a lot of ways, and all of the bits and pieces of the stuff in my life that I've cherished went right into it. You know, it's. Uh, I thought I would read a uh, a short uh, excerpt from the book, and then take some questions. Okay, the book opens, and actually it opens with a, with a uh, page that was the uh, suggestion of my daughter. My daughter read the, uh, the opening scene of this book as a yard sale, and she said to me, you know, Mom, I love that opening scene of the yard sale, but I know Melinda's going to disappear. And it made that scene much more tense, because I knew it. But I hadn't told the reader that. So when she told me that, I thought, aha. I need to put an opening to the book, and I did. I added this article that's a newspaper article dated two days, bef three days, um, it's three days after the yard sale, and it announced this pregnant woman missing in Brush Hills, and it tells Melinda White went to a yard sale and disappeared. And then you turn the page and you read the chapter with the yard sale. But that opening page was the very last thing that I wrote. And as I say, I wrote it because my very smart daughter, who is an architect, um, made a, an excellent observation. So I'll read, 
I'm going to skip through this opening uh, and just give you a flavor for the book. Saturday, November 1st. Rain or shine, that's what Ivy had put in the yard sale ad. What they'd gotten was a metallic gray sky and gusty wind, but the typical contrary New England fall weather hadn't discouraged this crowd. David moved aside the sawhorses that blocked the driveway, and buyers surged in. It seemed to Ivy that their Victorian ark tolerated the invasion, the way a great white whale might float to the surface and permit birds to pick parasites off its back. For three years, Ivy had been oblivious to the piles of junk left behind by elderly Paul Vlaskovic, the previous owner, a cadaverous fellow whom David referred to as Vlad. The clutter that filled their attic and basement might as well have existed in a parallel universe. Then, as sudden as a spring thunderstorm, the urge to expel what wasn't theirs had risen up in her until she could no longer stand it. Out! David had had the good grace, or maybe it was the instinct for self-preservation, not to blame it on hormones. Ivy felt the baby's firm kick. No more moth-winged flutter. Hello there, Sprout. She rested her palms on her belly, for the moment solid as a rock. With just three weeks to go until she either gave birth or exploded, <laughs> Ivy was supposed to be having contractions. Braxton Hicks. False labor. The revving of an engine not quite juiced up enough to turn over. She and David had reached the obsessing about a name stage, and she wondered how many other soon-to-be parents had tossed around the name Braxton. Viable, viable, viable. The word whispered itself over and over in her head. She'd married at 24, then it had taken five years to conceive. Three times she'd miscarried, the last time at 20 weeks, just when she thought it was safe to stop holding her breath. David came up alongside her and put his arm around where she'd once had a waist. A fully pregnant belly was pretty astounding, right up there with a prize-winning Hubbard squash. <laughs> hey, Stretch, he said. The name had taken on an entirely new connotation in these final months. Looks like we have ignition, quite a crowd. She shivered with pleasure as he pushed her hair to one side and nuzzled her neck. And I'm going to skip now to where Melinda appears. Excuse me, said a woman who peered at Ivy from under the brim of a Red Sox cap. She held a lime green depression glass swan-shaped dish that had, come, that had been in a box of fruit, wax fruit that mice had gotten to. You can have that for 15, Ivy said. Not a chip or crack on it. Ivy? The woman with cinnamon curls streaked silvery blonde had a mildly startled look. Don't remember me, do you? I, Ivy hesitated. There was something familiar about this woman who wore a cotton maternity top patterned in blue cornflowers and black-eyed Susans. Her hand, the nails polished pink and perfectly sculpted, rested on her own belly. Like Ivy, she was voluminously pregnant. Mindy White, Melinda, the woman said. Melinda back then. Melinda White. The name conjured the memory of a chubby girl from elementary school. Frizzy brown hair, glasses, a pasty complexion. It was hard to believe that this was the same person. Of course I remember you. Wow, don't you look great? And congratulations, Ivy said. You're first? Melinda nodded and took a step closer. She smiled. Her once crooked teeth were now straight and perfect. Isn't this your first, too? Ivy pro avoided her probing look. I'm due Thanksgiving, Melinda said. How about you? December, Ivy said. In fact, she was expecting a Thanksgiving baby, too. But Ivy had told everyone, even her best friend Jody, that her due date was two weeks later. As the end approached, it would be enough to deal with just her and David agonizing over when she was going into labor and whether something would go wrong this time. Melinda tilted her head and considered Ivy. Happy marriage, baby due any minute. You guys are so lucky. What more could you ask for? Kinahara was what Grandma Faye would have said to that and then spit to distract the eagle eye. Evil eye. Ivy rubbed the amulet hanging around her neck. And I'm going to skip now. Ivy's been selling things at the yard sale. Melinda is kind of three feet behind her. And now Melinda taps her on the shoulder. Ivy? Melinda's fingers were wrapped around the glass swan's slender neck. You can have that, my treat, Ivy said. The words were pleasant, but her tone was snappish. Melinda barely blinked. She tucked the swan dish into her canvas bag. Ivy cleared a spot on the steps to the side door and sank down. 
She had heartburn. Her morning OJ was repeating on her. She had to pee, and her ankles felt like overripe sausages about to burst their casings. Thank God David was on the way over. He crouched alongside her. You okay? He asked, asked under his breath. Ivy suppressed a burp, just tired. David pulled over a cardboard box filled with 1960s National Geographics and propped her feet on them. There's a guy looking for books, he said in his normal voice. Wasn't there a box that we didn't put out? If there is, it's still in the attic. David started for the house. He paused mid-step and turned back. Hey, Mindy, want to see the inside? Mindy? Could I? Mindy swung around. Her belly bumped into a card table and a large mirror that had been leaning against the table leg began to topple forward. Oh my gosh, she cried. Ivy reached over and caught the mirror just before it hit the ground. I'm so sorry. Melinda had gone white. She bit her lip and her face turned pinched. I mean, what if? It's okay, Ivy said. Don't worry about it. You sure? See, Ivy set the mirror upright. No damage done. Thank God, Melinda whispered. Really, it wouldn't have been a big deal. No big? Melinda stooped alongside where Ivy was sitting. She gave Ivy a penetrating look as she placed one hand on Ivy's belly and the other on her own. Through her sweatshirt, Ivy felt the pressure of Melinda's palm and the tips of those long pink fingernails against her taut skin. Are you kidding, Melinda said? We don't need any more bad luck, do we? Ivy felt her jaw drop. Melinda stood and turned to David. So did you keep the embossed wallpaper in the front hall and that wonderful statue at the foot of the stairs? You can see for yourself, David said. Go ahead in. I'll give you the grand tour. Melinda brushed past Ivy as she stepped, climbed the steps to the house. David rolled his eyes and followed. Ivy rubbed her palms across her belly, trying to erase the feel of Melinda's handprint. Hey, Melinda said from the doorway. Ivy turned. Melinda mouthed the words, see you, then turned and went inside, the screen door smacking shut behind her. Ivy sincerely hoped not. Oh. <laughs> so that's the opening of the book. And uh, it's a book which I advise you do not start an hour before you have to go to sleep. <laughs> I get a lot of people who say I kept them up at night going on. It's a it's a it's a it starts slow and builds questions. Can I answer anybody's questions? How long were you working on it? Did you I worked on this for three years. It seemed like forever. It was forever. How many rewrites? <laughs> it's hard to measure, you know. Uh, wh what I do as a writer is every time I make a major change to a manuscript, I save as, and I increment the number at the end of the file name. So I start Never Tell Lie 1, and my last file on this was Never Tell Lie 38. Oh. But that doesn't mean I did 38 complete revisions. It means that I made a major change 38 times. So beyond that. But a lot of revisions. And I will tell you, too, this book, I didn't think you could do this, but I sold this book to a publisher who didn't like the ending and wanted me to change it. I didn't even know you could do that. Um, so in addition to having written and rewritten it and rewritten it and rewritten it to satisfy my agent, I then had the same process to go through uh, with the editor. Uh, they felt the ending, I like the, the current ending a lot better. It, it ended very, somewhat differently. It, uh, I, think they, I think they had a very clear idea of who they thought the audience for this book was. And they felt that I had gone perhaps a little too far uh, uh, in terms of uh, writing some of the um, I guess violence. This doesn't, it's not really violence, but uh, it, it, that 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 the audience would like something uh, pulled back a little, a little bit to dial back the uh, so the you horror. Did, you rewrote it? Of course, I did. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. No, I'm not an O'Tour, Believe me. <laughs> I, if you if you wave a check in my face, <laughs> I say how high. <laughs> did they tell you how to end it? No, they didn't. They what they did was they told me what made them uncomfortable. <clears throat> Okay. And then left it up to you. And then left it up to me. And then I talked to my agent. I have a wonderful agent. And actually, the, what the publisher wanted was exactly along the lines of what my agent and I had talked about. We just hadn't gone far enough in that direction. 
The book ends, uh, you'll see the ending is not pat. The ending ha leaves a lot of loose ends. And um, they didn't have a problem with that. That was fine. It was more that they didn't want, I, they, they just, you know, I, I, I was just in Florida and uh, a lot of kids at the school had read my book uh, with their classes. And I was really glad that I had dialed it back because it makes it a book uh, that kids can read, uh, you know, big kids, high school kids. Whereas I think the original book that I turned in, I would have been a little bit uncomfortable with, um, n not that they, I mean, gosh, kids read everything these days, but, but this, the way that I handled it is, is much more, um, you know, it goes, what goes on in your head rather than on the page. Now, one reviewer on the back of the book described it as Hitchcockian suspense. Hitchcockian suspense. Would you agree Oh, with that? I love Hitchcockian <laughs> suspense. Yes, yes. Yeah, I think it's a little Twilight Zoney. It's a little Hitchcockian. You know, it's, it's because it's set in the suburbs. It's set in a place that we all feel safe. It's a suburban couple who have everything, you know. And, and actually, one of the pieces of research that I had to do, because it's set in the suburbs, I wasn't sure how a disappearance like this would be handled by local police. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I did was I called my Milton police, and I asked, you know, do you have a homicide detective? Because I wasn't sure maybe the state police would come in in case of a homicide. But they did. They had a homicide detective. He spent hours with me brought me in, showed me where they would drive a suspect in for questioning. Uh, so uh, everything that you read in this book, is the, that's the Milton Police Station. They, you know, the cameras swiveling, the doors smashing shut, the uh, counter where they book you, and there are handcuffs hanging from chains below the, below the counter where they would handcuff someone while they Mirandize and, and, and take a statement and uh, the uh, holding cells, and I had to get straight whether they, how long would they stay in the holding cells versus be taken to Denham. Denham, here we are. No, uh, we're not on. But we Denham Courthouse, which is, you know, down the road. Uh, at, or actually, I think it might have been Quincy that they would. Anyway, I, I got all of that worked out, and now I've fortunately forgotten it because I'm working on the next book, and my head is cluttered with details from that book. But, but they were very helpful. And one of the interesting things they said was that their jobs have changed since the John Bunny Ramsey case. Yeah, that that case with a little girl, uh, you know, mysteriously missing from a suburban middle class house where the Denver police pretty much, or was it the Colorado Springs? Colorado police basically gave the Ramseys a pass. They did not do the kind of lock down the house, treat it as a crime scene separate the husband and wife, interview them separately. They did not follow what should be standard procedure because these were middle class couple. Uh, instead, things have really changed now and where the person disappears or the parents are the number one suspects and you don't get a pass the way you used to. They talked to me about how they would handle Ivy and David as husband and wife and the fact that my plot had them having the same attorney they talked about how, what a big mistake that is. By the way, if anyone goes in your house and disappears, get your own attorney. And don't answer questions. And, I mean, we all know don't answer questions, and yet people do, you know? So I needed to write scenes in which the characters would do things that we know you shouldn't do. You shouldn't talk to the police. You should have your own attorney. And yet, you trust your husband, you trust this old friend, and you do things. Yes. Um, if I get one of my book groups to read this, I, I won't tell them your answer to this ahead of time. But it's always um, the question in all my book groups that I close the discussion with, and yeah. it's fun. Um, if this were made into a movie. Oh, and it just got an option. And without any limit on sort of age, yeah. um, I mean, it could be dead actor, actress, at yeah. a certain point in their life, who would be the ideal main characters in your mind? Um, I think for the woman I would like, um, 
God, I'm not coming up with her name. Who who was with um, Clint Eastwood? She played the woman boxer. Hillary Swank. Hillary Swank. Yeah. That I think she would be great. Hillary Swank because Hillary Swank can look plain. You know, she actually, you know, she even though you see her all dolled up at award ceremonies, she can absolutely look like an average person. And she's tall. This is a character who is. This is um, the what, Melinda. This is Ivy. Ivy. Melinda. I actually would like to see it made with the same actress playing both roles. Mm -hmm. oh. I would. Yes. And I would like to see it. That is, that's my vision. Now, I don't think these people who bought it have that vision of it. But I think it could be done that way. Uh, because I like, in, in a way, I thought of the two characters as kind of mirror images of each other. And, uh, and also because, well, I, I can't tell you why. <laughs> I can't tell you the rest of why. And the man, and the husband? Uh, the husband is less clear to me. It could be. Maybe David can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know who the husband would be, but I, I, I actually would. My next door neighbor <laughs> could play the part. You know, when you write, you uh, or I do have a physical person in mind when I'm writing a character. Um, and when I wrote Ivy, I really kind of had a tall, slim version of myself, someone who perhaps had breasts. That would be <laughs> another thing. And, uh, and when I wrote David, I really, you know, was more channeling, you know, people that I have grown up with, people that I know. But I've written books with, you know, a picture of a movie star on my... What I had on my computer while I was writing this book is the picture of a house. Because the house is such an important character in this book. I mean, Ivy's world becomes that house as it closes around her. Yes? Yeah, that's <coughs> what I'm being intrigued. I haven't read about or known anything about the book before. I'm kind of sitting and listening to you here and talking so little about how this wicker thing is made and all these details with the house and so on. It seems like... What, what do you think about, um, I would guess you were an architect and not an, uh, a writer. Do you know well, what I mean? It's such an eye yeah. for an... I, I do have an eye know, for detail. Do you yeah. know what that is yeah. about? No, I, I, but I do believe that good fiction is the accretion of the right detail. Not mm -hmm. every detail, mm -hmm. but picking the right details is what writing fiction is about. Um, and I will tell you this too. I have, you know, every writer has the things that are easy for them and the things that are difficult. For me, dialogue is very difficult. I never remember what anyone said, <laughs> unless I write it down. And actually, it's why I'll go around with a little pad. I just don't have a memory for words. So you're visual writer. But I'm totally visual. If I went into a room, I can tell you what was hanging on the wall. I can tell you the furniture. I can tell you who was sitting where. I won't remember mm -hmm. their names, but I remember who was where. Uh, I will remember what was served. I will know all about the food. I'll remember every detail of that. And that's how our memories are. And I think the way that you think is reflected in the way that you write. You know. And so for me, I'm just a very visual person. So I use that. But if you use too much of it, it numbs the reader. People don't want a lot of detail. They just want the right amount. And that's why I have a writing group. I'm in a writing group with... Um, three other published authors, and we look at each other's work as it's coming along. And I rely on them to make sure that I don't go on for too long. But my tendency when I write is to write too little rather than too much. I'm a very spare writer. You'll see when you read it, there's not much fat on that skeleton mm -hmm. you know, of the story. Uh, I write very spare, very lean, and the details that are there Almost every one of them is there, there for a reason. You know that s the swan that she's grasping the neck of? <laughs> it's there for a reason. Is it fair to say you write enough detail so that the reader can visualize the scene? Yeah, that's true. So if you were writing a well, scene... Yeah. It's cinematic in, this in that locale, way. Yeah, yeah. There'd be enough description of the bookshop so people could visualize it. I, I think so, and I think uh, I think people fill in their own background. I mean, you'll put your own Victorian house in this place, but there will be enough uh, of a description to make it, I hope, to make it 
a visceral place for you. Well, thank you all so much for coming. You've been a great audience. I'll be happy to sign books if yes. anybody would like me to, or just chat if you have any questions. And for all friends, please come up and say hello. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, first of all, I want to say, because somebody successfully bid on a 220-year-old oh. big house, yeah. <laughs> you dodged a bullet. We do have her book here for you to, and you can more than happy to sell it to you. Uh, I'm glad she'll be here uh, signing it. Next week we're having Geraldine Brooks here. Oh, I've uh, heard her. Because uh, uh, wow. people of the book came out recently in paperback and she'll be coming. Mm -hmm. So we hope to see you then. And thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.